Hey guys, this is John, and I'm playing NC in the 15-minute pool on ICC. NC opens with D4. Should we play something unusual today? Hmm. I'm just going to play that F6 and then decide what to do against C4. You know what I might try for? I might try for a Grunfeld. I haven't played any Grunfelds that I can recall from the black side in my 15-minute games. If I have, I've played maybe one. But the Grunfeld is obviously a, a very legitimate weapon against D4, and it's more popular now than ever. It's an opening that um, in its early days didn't really have much respect and falls into the hypermodern category, controlling the center with your pieces uh, rather than pawns directly. But it's uh, a, a major weapon for many of the top young players in the world, especially. And some of the old guard, too, like Peter Svidler is a notorious Grunfeld expert. So, okay, so he plays bishop f4. I'll just play bishop g7 against that. I might be playing more on general principles than exact knowledge, which is a pretty dangerous thing to do in this opening because this opening doesn't lend itself well to uh, principles so much. You pretty much have to know exactly what to do in some of these sharp positions. But I figure with the rating differential, I can probably get away with this. He's playing a very sensible line, e3. I think he might go c5 now. That's something that black typically does. Um, idea is if c5 and they play dc, I have queen a5, attacking the pawn on c5 and also getting ready for Ideas like knight e4, triple attacking c3. So let's play that. I just don't want white to be able to develop in standard fashion, like let's say knight f3 and then bishop e2 and castle. I'd rather try to take him in the center right now. So now this move. And if he keeps chopping pawns, he could land in trouble. Like c takes d5, knight takes d5. If queen takes d5, we have bishop takes c3. his rook on a1 will be in trouble. This position is not yet dangerous for white, but they have to respond correctly. Yeah, like rook c1 looks like a good idea. Hmm. Now, do I play knight e4, or do I take on c4, bishop takes, and then play queen takes c5? I'm trying to remember if I've had this from the white side before, because I have played the bishop f4 line on occasion. So if I castle and they take on d5, knight e4, knight g2, yeah, that looks very reasonable for them. So I'm thinking I'll probably take on c4. And then after bishop takes, we'll regain the pawn, queen takes c5. Yeah, let's do that. It's a simple path and gets the pawn back. If I had more precise knowledge of how to play this, I would possibly speculate on other things, but we're just going to do this. It's a little dangerous to line up my pieces down the C file like this, but I don't see any way he can like um, get the bishop out of the way and then move the knight to introduce a discovery on my bishop on C8 or skewer on my bishop on C8. Let's just check NC stats while we have a moment. So this player has a peak rating of 1711. Um, they played 31 games, 23 wins, 8 losses. Pretty new. So what could they play here? Queen b3. That attacks f7. Um, almost certainly I'll castle against this move. Let's say castles and they put a knight on f3 or e2. I play knight c6. Looks fine to me. The rook on c1 is now no longer defended by the queen, so any discoveries that they might try to set up are going to be hampered. Actually, I wonder if knight b5... 
is an issue. Hmm, knight b5. Is that a problem? Because then they're threatening bishop takes f7, and also knight c7. <laughs> well, if that's played, things will get interesting. <laughs> All right, he plays it. <laughs> okay, so let me just think about this now. Yeah, bishop takes f7 is a big threat, and just the fork on c7. I'm less worried about the fork, honestly, because um, let's say I play a move like um, e6 runs into bishop d6. But let's say I play something to address bishop takes f7, and they do actually go knight c7. I might be able to get away with playing e5. And then if they take my knight in the corner, I take on f4, and very likely that knight will be stranded. So I might be able to speculate. Um, also, maybe knight d5 is playable in this position. Is that just insane, or does that actually seem OK? Knight d5 blocks bishop takes c4. The rook on c1 is undefended. That's why my eye was drawn to this move. It's artificial though, like they could play knight e2 and renew the defense of the rook. I could play bishop e6 in this position. Bishop e6, let's say knight c7. Hmm. I have a problem with the with the rook though. Hmm. e6 runs into bishop d6, as I was saying earlier. Could play king h8. That just looks strange, though. I'm just going to check knight d5, knight e2 again. Because if knight takes f4, there's bishop takes f7, unfortunately. What about bishop e6, knight c7, queen a5 check? Probably queen c3, though. Queen c3 spoils a lot of fun. Hmm. Clearly, I must find something precise now. I mean, king h8 is the only thing that's really standing out to me. And as I said, it just looks like a superficial <laughs> move on the whole. It does deal with bishop takes f7 check, though. What about just moving my queen? Queen f5? Queen f5, knight c7, e5. The problem is they can just move their bishop back, and they'll still be threatening knight takes a8. Yeah, it's kind of crazy, but king h8 is the only move I'm seeing that looks halfway decent. Hmm. All right, let's give it a shot. So yeah, the idea is that bishop takes f7 no longer works. It hangs the rook on c1. 
And if knight c7, I'm going to play e5. And if they take the rook in the corner, I take on f4, and I'm hoping that I have enough play there. What concerns me is if they just play a move like knight e2. Okay, he's going to go for the material, but yeah, I'm, I was wondering about knight e2. We'll check that after the game. So e5 now. Do I want to throw in queen a5? Hmm, probably not. No, it's not. You can now see why I haven't been chopping at the bit to include the Grunfeld in my repertoire. <laughs> I really dislike irrational openings like this. I feel like I don't really have a firm understanding of what's going on. Um, okay, so he takes. He's just going to take the rook next move. Well, we got to grab here. So knight takes a8. I'll play knight c6. I do have quite a bit of play. So knight c6, idea, move the bishop. Yeah, okay, let's do this. Not have to move a little faster now. I've been down on time on so many of my games recently. Nothing new, but it's worth pointing out. So if knight f3 and I give a check on a5, queen c3. Queen c3 is annoying because if I trade queens, then the knight has c7 to escape to. So maybe I should settle for queen e7 instead. Queen e7, maybe queen a3. Well, I can just play queen b8 here, can't I? Oh yeah, queen b8 must be the best move. Yeah, we better play this while we can. <clears throat> They can take an f7, maybe. I take a8, and then we have an interesting position where I have uh, two minor pieces against the rook and two pawns. I wouldn't mind playing that. Not like I have a choice. I have to play that. <laughs> they could also play knight b6. a takes b6, and then queen takes b6 if they want to get one of my queen side pawns. On knight b6, I actually wonder if I want to throw in knight a5. I may want to do that. Because then, let's say they play their queen somewhere, like, I don't know, queen b4. I can take on b6, they take with their queen, and then I can eliminate that light square bishop. If I could get the bishop pair, that would be helpful. I bet this is some sort of theory. Um, I'm guessing queen takes c5 is considered somewhat dubious. It may actually turn out to be not that bad. I mean, maybe all of this is tactically justified. It's just like trying to find your way through a very dense forest, and um, <laughs> you know there's a compass out there, aka the opening book, but you didn't bother to look at it before you started wandering into the forest. But that's what makes these, makes these games fun. Uh, I'm really having a good time uh, experimenting with my openings in these videos. Like in doing these videos, since I started my channel, I played a lot of different openings that I never previously would have really thought about playing, but I'm just kind of like, uh, let's go for this opening today and make it interesting. I don't do really outlandish stuff. Like I'm not playing just gambits all over the place and, um, really playing things that aren't um, at least somewhat respectable, but I'm branching out to other systems. Knight g5. Makes sense. Thinking knight e5 in reply might be okay. So if I play knight e5,
what then? Knight c7 is nothing. I can just take it. I'd like to defend this pawn before embarking on anything further. I could also maybe play h6. h6, knight takes f7, king h7. But I worry about that. Like maybe even h4 then. Idea of knight g5. It's messy. That's very messy. Knight e5 just seems like the move. Something about it. Yeah, let's go for it. Playing actively, not recovering the knight yet. I'm also somewhat eyeing the d3 square in doing this. I don't know if that will deter them from playing a move like bishop takes f7, but I am making them think about the defense of d3. Forking potential on the king of the rook. Check. Hmm. Take with the knight. Okay, so I'll take here. And I'm going to take their knight on the next move. So they do ultimately get two pawns and a rook for the two minor pieces. He has to take on f7. I wouldn't bother thinking about this if I were white. Unless he's considering knight b6, but yeah, I would doubt that knight b6 would be worth spending time on. So we have a unbalanced position. I'm expecting them to castle. Maybe queen b8 then. Looking to play knight g4. This bishop is awkward. I actually don't really mind having the bishop in on f7. It might turn out to be a liability for white. I'm not sure how I feel about the possibility of them playing Bishop e6, though. I'd rather keep three minor pieces on the board if, if I could. Queen b8 looks to play knight g4. Let's say queen b8, bishop e6, knight g4. Bishop takes g4, bishop takes g4. I should be okay playing that position. b6 is another possibility. Just trying to get on the long diagonal. I'm not sure I want to allow the rook into c7, though. Let's just choose this one. Knight e4 might have been decent on the last move as well. Idea of threatening knight d2. Maybe f3 is okay for them. Covering the e4 and g4 squares, getting ready to play pawn e4. If f3, I might play b6, now that c7 is taken care of. If I play b6, then knight d7 to c5 becomes possible, because the c5 square is a nice anchor. I've mentioned this in previous videos, but... Um, Two minor pieces versus a rook and a single pawn, in, in my experience, usually favors the two minor pieces. But two minor pieces versus a rook and two pawns is a much closer call. You can kind of go either way. So we'll see how this plays out. Um, knight e4, I was considering this move earlier, and I still like the look of it. It's a little bit loose, but I am threatening knight d2. There's a certain pressure on f2 as well. It looks tactically justified, so let's do it. Just kind of checking to make sure they don't have any queen moves, like stuff like queen b4, hitting my knight, eyeing the rook on f8. I just got to make sure I can handle moves like that. And I believe I can, because their queen is somewhat tethered to their bishop as well. That's going to prevent them from doing too much here tactically.
Assuming they cover the D2 threat, I really like the look of B6 next move. I should be aware that if I do play B6, assuming their rook is on the C file, knight C5 is not a threat because they would have rook take C5, and I'm pinned here. So I must bear that in mind. I wonder if the knight is useful on the king side too, like knight G5. Maybe I could set up sacrifices on H3. I've got long range pieces, the queen and the two bishops to work with. I don't think he'll play rook fd1 because I think he'll be hesitant to uh, leave the f2 square only guarded by the king, especially with my rook sitting here on f8. So I predict he'll play rook c2. Rook c2 looks solid because then the rook also assists in guarding the f pawn. Maybe just bishop f5 on rook c2, threatening discoveries, threatening moves like knight d6. We could play g4 then. Might get crazy. Voluntarily open their king, but looks pretty good. Here's an interesting line. Rook c2, bishop f5, g4, knight g5. Not moving the bishop. They take, and I'd probably take on f7 then. Not sure with which piece, the knight or the rook. Rook takes, they might have f4. Okay, they do actually play this move. So now I'm really wondering if f2 represents a possible sacrifice. This is a principled move. Like he's showing he's not going to disrupt his development. He's not afraid of ghosts necessarily. Hmm. Problem is I want to use my knight to attack their bishop, but I need it to attack f2 as well. <laughs> so it presents a problem. Maybe queen e5. Queen e5 looks kind of strong. Because then I'm attacking b2. I'm defending the knight. d8 is not a problem. I've got that covered. I wonder if they can do like queen e5, queen b4, or something like that. Idea being that if I take, they have rook d8. I don't think that's that good though. Let's try it. Gets my queen involved. b2 is a liability. And I'm thinking like if they defend b2 somehow, like maybe queen, queen f6. Or queen f5, probably queen f6. Attack the bishop again. I can maybe swing my queen over to g5 too, setting up bishop takes h3. There's a lot of stuff going on in this position. Yeah, rook c2 makes sense. Does knight c5 do any damage? None that I see right off the bat. about bishop f5? Bishop f5. Hmm. Leaves the b-pawn loose. All right, I have two and a half minutes left, so time to make some decisions. All right, let's do bishop f5. It's threatening. I don't think they like the x-ray on their rook. If rook d5, I can just drop back to e7. No harm, no foul. We're going to ramp up the play as we both get into time pressure. Position's far too complex for having three minutes, less than three minutes on our clocks.
I predict he'll play rookie too. And against that, maybe queen e7, just to attack the bishop and kind of secure the b7 pawn. Kind of thinking like queen e7, bishop d5, b6, maybe f3, I can get into g3. Just doubles up. This guy is totally unafraid of my potential discoveries. Let's play b6. We've got the c8 square defended twice by our bishop and our rook. So he can't take there. I thought about knight d6, which would hit the rook and the bishop, but he has rook c5 against that. And I want to keep my knight on e4. I like it there. It's threatening on that square. Time is ticking down. He's at about a minute and a half. He's got to, he's got to move soon. Rook c7. Okay, here I have knight c5, cutting off the coordination between his rooks. That just wins material, doesn't it? Anything else looking good? No, let's do this. This wins an exchange. He's got to take. I'll pre-move that. I'm attacking his queen, and yeah, the rook coordination has been cut. Okay, so b2 is hanging. His bishop is still awkward on this square. Also, his rook is hanging. Most importantly. <laughs> okay, just queen takes e b2 now. Looks simple. Let's do it. I'm okay with trading. Um, I am up one point of material, and I have a passed c pawn. He probably should trade and like put his bishop on c4. Something like that. If I could trade the light square bishops, that would be helpful. Hmm. Bishop a3. Maybe bishop e4. Yeah, bishop e4 hitting his rook. And if bishop takes, rook takes b2, I can take on f7. That's what I'm thinking. Let's do that. I'd rather get a pair of bishops off this bishop. I just don't want it blockading my c-pawn. I'm okay with trading any pair of bishops. He does take. This ending should be winning. He'll probably play f3. Yeah, his time is way too low now. Um, let's just go bishop d5. If rook b5, I have rook c7. Defending. From his point of view, he'd like to exchange these uh, pawns, like the a for the c pawn, if he could. But I'm not going to let that happen. Okay, let's just drop this back, because I know he's going to play e4. Yeah, he lost on time. So, yeah, he went astray in the time pressure. Let's take a look and see if we can figure out what's going on in this highly tactical game. So bishop f4 is one way of combating the Grinfeld. Most players take on d5, and then play e4. This is the main line. And black intends to play bishop g7 followed by c5, um, knight c6, putting lots of pressure on d4. That's the whole theory behind the Grinfeld, is that you can attack white center from a distance. It's in the hypermodern category. But he plays bishop f4, and bishop g7, e3, I played c5, 
Outwardly, this looks risky, but this is, as I said, a very standard idea in the Grunfeld to play c5 in open lines in the center. So if he had continued taking, I was going to take here. And if queen takes, I take with the bishop. And if white continues chopping, Check. then I fork these two pieces. Um, I wonder, is there some possibility with like king e2, queen takes, and then bishop e5? I actually calculated this originally, but I thought I had queen takes a2, but now I see that I don't. Hmm. The engine says this is equal somehow. Queen c1, bishop takes h8, bishop here, queen takes b7, queen check. c2 check with some, some sort of perpetual. If he tries to come here, check. I check, he can't go here because he gets mated on g4. Check. So this is, I'm sure, some sort of book draw. Interesting. They played rook c1, and I took on c4. Bishop takes, and I take here. Okay, so this appears to be <laughs> almost a losing move. Remember what I said about trying to find your way in a very um, dense forest? Yeah, this is what I mean. Like, <laughs> going into a sharp line like this without uh, prior knowledge is a risky proposition. I mean, you can get away with doing that in openings that are slower, but in sharp openings like this, you're really asking for it. Um, I wouldn't do this over the board, and I wouldn't do this against someone closer to my own rating. So if he had played knight b5 right away, again with these ideas, then I really would have been tr been in trouble. Queen b4 check. check, trying to get at least get out of the bishop takes f7 discovery. King f1. Yep, I could see why this would be bad. Yeah, knight c7 is simply a huge threat. Hmm. What if I play like knight a6 or something? a3. What if queen b4? Bishop c7. Ouch. And then if I do this, Check. I'm again falling Check. foul of the bishop takes f7 trick. Discovery on my queen. Okay, well good to know. So more than likely, yeah, I should have castled right here. And then only regain the pawn on the next move. So it says that white should play some generic developing move, and then I take... Yeah, that's not nearly as bad. Like now knight b5, I can deal with it much easier. I would assume even, whoops, even Check. this move might be okay. But the engine also says this is good. And if bishop takes, I take here. Hmm, lesson learned. Okay, so queen takes c5, queen b3. This still was pretty good though. I castled. Knight b5. It was hard to find a defense to this. He likes bishop e6. I thought about this. What didn't I like about that? I think I just didn't like knight c7. Queen a5 check. check. I thought like queen c3. Check. Take. Well, I guess they, they might have to take with the rook in order to defend the bishop in this case. So that does cast some doubt on white's play. And that's very messy. I'm attacking the rook now, which is in turn defending the bishop, and he's attacking my rook, which can't move. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I played king h8. I wonder what the computer thinks about that move. May not be that much worse than bishop e6, because nothing I could find was working. Just the two threats. Uh, knight c7 and bishop takes f7. If e6, there's bishop d6, I thought at the very least. Going after my rook on f8. So king h8. You play knight c7. And then e5. It might be in white's best interest just to make a developing move like the engine saying, just knight f3. And saying like, well, you wasted all this time calculating these complications. I don't even have to go for the rook if I don't want to. I'm just going to develop and castle and your pieces are still somewhat awkward. That's not a bad way of playing at all. Knight e2, in my mind, makes even more sense, because with knight e2, aren't we threatening queen takes? Or, ah, bishop takes f7 with an attack on the queen, I mean. So I have to do... Yeah. I'm losing something. I'm pretty sure. I think I would have done that if I were white, knight e2 or knight f3. But he went for this, and now e5. 
And it's messy at this point. Because yes, he does win my rook in the corner. But that knight is probably not coming back. And white is behind the development now. I've already castled. So it completely changes the character of the position. Knight c6, knight f3. I went back to b8. The engine actually likes Check. queen a5 checked better. Did I consider that move? I think I did. Queen c3. Yeah, and I was remarking that um, after this, I didn't Check. like the possibility of trading because the knight can get out through c7 now. But the computer says queen check. a5 check, queen c3, you can just play queen d8 and probably move this bishop and then take the knight. I guess that's true. And the queen is not comfortable on c3 because it's right in the line of fire of my bishop on g7. Hmm. Queen b8 looks more normal, though. It's, it's the most efficient way to get the uh, knight back. So he played knight g5. I went knight e5. F4 is strong here. Hmm. Knight takes, queen takes, I assume. Threatening f7 twice, also eyeing the bishop. Yeah, and if I play king g8... Ah, okay, the knight can come out through c7 again. Yeah, okay. f4. Hmm. Yeah, I could see why that would be good. d5. I have to resort to desperate measures to complicate. Okay. I didn't look at f4 too closely. But for that reason, maybe the computer's right that knight d8 is better. It's a more passive way to defend f7, but I don't run into f4 with tempo. And I can still hope to recover this knight. As played, though, knight Check. e5, knight takes f7, knight takes, bishop takes, queen takes. I felt okay here. The computer might still slightly prefer white, but I think I have sufficient play. Certainly after he castles, I feel I have sufficient play. Bishop e6 might be better. Trying to work immediately to eliminate a set of Meyer pieces. Even that looks complicated. Knight e4, attacking f2. If castles, I assume, knight d2. It's messier now. And that's what I want after those. I mean, if you, show, if you told me I could have this position after I was faced with knight b5 on move 10, I would have taken it in a heartbeat because I managed to escape with my skin and um, I'm still fighting, and we actually have a pretty intriguing imbalance on our hands. So here I played queen b8. Yeah, again, bishop e6 is the main suggestion. I just get the impression he left the bishop on f7 for far too long. Maybe he thought that bishop would kind of impede my play and like block my rook, but it's a constant headache for white trying to defend that piece with their queen. It's not like a desirable battery to have the bishop in front needing defense from the queen. The queen shouldn't be assigned a defensive role like that for more than a few moves, ideally. h3, I played the knight into e4. Here, queen e5. Okay, bishop f5 is even better. Maybe that anticipates rook c2. The computer much prefers that move, bishop f5. I liked queen e5. It seemed cohesive. Defends the knight and also attacks b2. We were both getting pretty low on time at this point. Uh-huh, so I had bishop takes h3. Why is that? So if g takes, queen g5 check. Check. What is going on? Okay, well, let's just say for the sake of argument, they hide queen h5, hitting h3, hitting d1. That's hard to see. I mean, if you spend too long calculating here, you're dead. Because the position is still so volatile. If you spend too much time calculating, first of all, you risk the cal the um, you risk just miscalculating basically and wasting like half your time in doing so. So you have to walk the line between playing something good and tricky, um, and also not using too much time. So I just tried to play natural moves that I thought would assist me in the attack, like Bishop F five, X raying his his rook on uh, C two, threatening discoveries. b6 looks like a good idea. Yep. So this enables knight c5, and there's no longer a queen takes b7 threat. And he's just got to get that bishop out of there. You can see. Now it thinks black is doing very well, but it was saying bishop d5 for a second. Queen d5 looking for trades. Yeah. White's got to bail out, because suddenly white's coordination is um, questionable. And they can't go rook c8. It's very nice that my rook and bishop both defend that square. So rook c7, yep, ran into knight c5. 
That was a turning point. And now I'm up material. Moreover, they were using a lot of time too. They didn't really give themselves a fighting chance in this end game. And I'm happy to trade a pair of bishops because I was I was more concerned if they had played a move like bishop c4 blockading this pawn. I wasn't exactly concerned, I would say, but it would be harder to make use of my c pawn, and white keeps more resources on the board. I think when they trade bishops, the position is very much clarifying in my favor. Yeah, this end game should be a technical win. Aha, bishop d3 looks even better than I can more properly escort my c pawn up the board. If they could somehow exchange the a pawn for the c pawn, they might be able to draw. I do have the correct bishop, like my bishop is the same color as my h-pawn's queening square, that's important. Um, if it wasn't, all they would have to do to draw is just eliminate this g-pawn. But um, as it stands, yeah, I don't think white can hold this, even if the game had been played out. So, pretty complicated game, and this game taught me that um, I can't just blindly play c5 and then hope to recover the pawn. In the Grunfeld, I might have to exercise more caution and like castle first and then play queen take c5. And this should be a good lesson to you guys that there are certain openings that you can get away with just like kind of knowing a few main ideas and looking at a couple lines. This isn't one of them though. <laughs> openings like the Grunfeld, uh, the Sicilian Nightorf, um, pretty much any sharp line you can think of where the evaluation of the position depends precisely on knowing like one key line or multiple key lines. That's not the type of opening you just want to trot out on a whim. The only reason I this is like a this is a don't try this at home video. <laughs> okay. And having said that, the Grunfeld is a perfectly good opening. It's just not one I've studied, and you know I risk disasters like you know being uh, minus three and a half after eight moves, as you saw. So thank you guys for watching. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. I'll be back tomorrow with another fifteen minute game. Talk to you guys later. Bye.